So once upon a time, there was this aggressive, refreshing 3D fighter that looked like it was trying to take Altered Beast into the 21st century. And its development's really fascinating. See the developers rising, aiding, and Hudson Soft got a bunch of anime, guitars, and leather together, and it ended up looking like... But the series underwent a terrifying transformation. At some point, Activision and later Konami got tangled up in the publishing process of these games, so you can imagine how well that went. Nowadays, people mostly remember Bloody Roar as that fun, not really competitive Tekken-like, and I don't want to do that, so today we're looking into the aesthetics, the gameplay, the mechanics, and the competitive potential of the Bloody Roar franchise. And we will not be appealing to the geek culture masses, okay, there will be no Animorphs reference, there will be no BNA reference. There will be no Emperor's New Groove reference. Bloody Roar, or as the states might have called it, Beasterizer, is the amniotic fluid glazed first pass at a promising game. It plays a bit like Soul Blade, another prototype fighter in a long running series in that it's a 2.5D experience. Yes, you're in 3D space, but there's no dedicated strafe button and the game doesn't really integrate this space into combat. So you're mostly locked to whatever axis you're on unless you roll while recovering or a move sends you spinning. That's not a knock to the game's quality, it's just what other games were doing at at the time. Bloody Roar has a lot of interesting gameplay abnormalities that set it apart from the competition, but let's start small. The number of game modes on offer is sparse, even compared to Soul Blade. The roster is limited and extremely hit or miss in terms of visuals, shall we say? Ew, 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 ew. To be fair, that's like 90% old PlayStation 1 polygonal business. I'm telling you, I better not hear any of that, or oh, who would ever play this Lego looking game, K Bash? Because. Listen here, you little shit. But it begs the question, why play Bloody Roar at all? Oh. It sold itself with the promise of violence, but with a lighter touch than Mortal Kombat. Oh, and there was something about animals too. In a market full of fists and swords, what's a new game to do but innovate? Bloody Roar built transformation mechanics into the framework of a traditional fighter, and that affected button economy. For example, Tekken had left and right punches and kicks assigned to each button, and Soul Calibur used vertical and horizontal swings, a kick, and a guard. Bloody Roar used punch and kick buttons, a beast button that lets you ape the f out and could be used thereafter for beast attacks. There was also a fourth button that changed usage between installments. In this game, it functions as a power-up called Rave that basically turbocharges your character, and you better believe with innovation comes many unexpected problems. And, in this case, being a first game, foundational issues. I mean, first off, wow, two usable damage buttons and an unlockable one? And you can't mix buttons for new attacks? What is this, a little baby game? In some ways, it plays more like Street Fighter than your average 3D fighter. Every character can string certain moves together, but you can cancel into command attacks to finish combos, which 3D fighters didn't do. They established an aggressive game with lower overall damage per hit, unlike other games of the era. Now every Bloody Roar is pretty cheesy, I've seen enough 90% health combos to think it's systemic, but it packs a visual punch, the game's crazy fun to watch. Yeah, mole dude, cut him up! Animal transformations, sick animations, blood, and so many moves send dudes flying. Hey, nice get-up attack, dweeb! It's a great spectacle fighter, it's just the mechanics are shaky. The series staple, Transformation, is a cool idea, but only if it's handled well. First off, the beast button, when you have enough gauge, is the only true reversal option in the game. You're universal sure you can, and you only get it when you're human and your bar's full. Maybe if you're an FGC connoisseur, you can see the problem. Especially when you're getting bullied in a corner with no strafe. Beast form recovers any gray health over time and unlocks more of your offense, makes you run faster and jump Jump higher. It's good. Yeah, give him that dirty gorilla ass. And both players get it from the start. A lot of the game is forcing your opponent into it first and holding onto your own as long as possible because if you're ever winning, ever in a position where the enemy has no beast form and has to knock it out of you, and you have a health lead, and you're recovering a portion of the damage your enemy deals, and you can pop rave mode to gain additional move cancel properties for better combos, better speed, better damage, it's not even close. The beast mode economy kind of takes over the game. It's a shame because the other elements, like the weak wake-up game which partially staunches hard aggro because it's only single wake-up hits, elements like being able to evade by hugging the floor, guard break attacks in a game with weak reversal options, and the interesting combo system make Bloody Roar look awesome. Aggressive. It also means the series' greatest strength could be its downfall.
What the heck is this? There's a temptation to assume that because something is sound, it will be well loved. Not so. Bloody Roar 2 isn't a joke. Yeah, it looks old, but it also sold better than any game in the series. Though I'm interested in a mechanical discussion of the game, almost none of it matters because the series didn't catch fire despite sales, didn't ripple through America, you know, never got to Evo. Whatever scene there was seems relegated mostly to South America and Vietnam, and in the West, it's mostly lost to time. And say what you want, the game deserves praise because it's a total aesthetic overhaul. You know, Bloody Roar 1, guys, what the hell were you thinking? The roster got a mega glow up, ditching all but four of the original characters and adding quality additions. I always thought Bloody Roar's best designs easily made Tekkens look ancient by comparison. I think it's because the game removed a lot of the normie mammalian types and really leans into the weird stuff. The Hercules Beetle, the Chameleon, the Batgirl, even the half-beast, half-human girl stands out. The illustrated characters look a lot better too, a lot more charismatic. And fighting game stories generally suck, but hey, two's spinning a tale of combating prejudice in the face of an emergent minority of citizens who are feared by the general populace for being born a certain way. Wow, looks like it doesn't suck after all. Battle away, you dang rapscallions. Now with the solid aesthetic alterations, you'd expect some buckwild gameplay changes, son! God, you can shoot me for that. Many fans will say Bloody Roar 2 is the best installment, and it's hard to be sure, but here's the gameplay. Transforming is more than a reversal now. You can input command beast moves, like your Hadoukens and the like, while your bar is full, and you'll seamlessly morph into beast mode while attacking. You can do this mid-combo as well, which really helps meaningful, option-rich aggression flourish. Beast attacks do chip damage, Damage now. The mode makes you tankier, able to jump off walls, stronger in general. What's interesting is how beast form management improved. Meter will build on its own now, alongside landing hits on the enemy. Additionally, blocking attacks in beast form will slightly drain your meter. Rave mode is gone, which is unfortunate because it wasn't some boring special move, but a tactical improvement that really made you scary if you played well. Instead, you can dump all your meter into a boring special move. Okay, I can't say it completely seriously. These things are so sick, dude. Oh, these look horrible. Horrible on the PC edition. <laughs> so meter rises and falls with the pace of the match. Players can potentially transform multiple times, and you're incentivized to play into that flow by dropping beast form for major damage in a combo. Offense is about the same, though more characters come loaded with disgusting combo potential. Like, I get it, okay. Virtua Fighter kind of dropped the ball early on, you know, you do your clothesline. Was that 40? But you're not doing any better letting players combo 90% of the enemy health bar. And mix-ups are good in this game, maybe too good with a consistent universal reversal tool. Characters hit fast, high then low, it's tough to block everything. They probably understood this and tried to balance it with two block functions. Keeping the left stick neutral will perform a light block that leaves you able to react much faster to enemy attacks and yeah, eat through their follow-up offense with a deathly combo. It seems like an oversight, but many beast mode attacks cause guard break early on, so it's not totally busted. The game gives you beast mode right away if you need it. They also gave the player a heavy block, which can even block guard breaks, and as a dedicated button, but functions basically like a regular guard, you can't just instantly attack out of it. It even functioned as a command move cancel, deepening the potential for mind games, and was foundational to the offense of the game. Overall, yeah, it's solid, but I don't think it has the chops to maintain public interest. I don't know if what I'm saying makes it sound great, but again, to reiterate, never at EVO, nobody cared. My bet is the game looked too swingy, because even if the ability to really crush your enemy's soul with resource denial is gone, you can still get combo to death in a second. You're still dealing with mix-ups that should be illegal. Yeah, they're not the worst, but other 3D fighters like Soul Calibur generally give enemies pretty fair grace periods to react to high-low mix-ups, and have a degree of animation sophistication not really present here. A lot of what opens you up will likely feel unreactable. I think they went in the right direction, however, and it might have been truly great if combo potential was toned down and light guarding was turned into a true parry system or something. But there's a promising game here. For some, Bloody Roar 2's quick dissipation was a resonant, glorious roar, and for others it was a whimper. Either way, nobody's got the soundbite to prove it. You think you're funny? I don't want to alienate Bloody Roar 2 fans, but there's a case for this game. Bloody Roar 3 is something of a rock for the series. It's the middle installment. It captures the aesthetics and tight gameplay laid down by previous titles. And it's the first developed for the PS2, no more chunky arms. Above that, some fans think it's the most competitively viable, so let's slit this blooded corpse open. Did you have to write that? Aside from the blasé stages and outdated character costumes, the game is visually sound. At least Alice looks like a person now instead of a 
a Mega Man character. I haven't commented on the audio up until now, but not much has changed. Whining guitars, screaming people, if you like it, you're probably 30. But let's get to the meat already. This game in particular had an American community with at least a pulse at some point. This short you can thread, link in the description, details a lot of what I'm gonna go into, so props for that. First off, elephant in the room, yeah, not a single game on offer has perfect balance. There are infinite combos if you really look, but they're extremely impractical and a lot of what might look infinite in training mode loses to air control, right? Bloody Roar 3 has been described as so broken it's balanced, meaning everyone has something abusable that can swing the game in their favor. And the swinginess of 2 hasn't gone away, beast drives still deal 40-60% to 60 every time, which is completely absurd. Even using them in combos doesn't appear to diminish the damage. So your characters start with a nuke, right? They have beast drive potential. Scary. So then they gave another, and another, and another. Um, Rave is conceptually back as hyper beast mode and only usable with a full beast bar, but really lets you screw dudes up. And hey, with all the mix up potential in the game, offense is seriously terrifying. Then they took the one step overboard. Why not? In older games, combos were grounded, relied on bounces in the wall, and the air was pretty safe. You could recover there, you could block, you could attack while landing. So I guess the devs called up Zangief and asked, hey, uh, our airspace is a little too safe. And he said, Protect Guys. Introducing Air Cancel, letting players launch and follow opponents into the air like Dante for a skybound beatdown. Now it's not all about offense, admittedly defensive options are worse and better, strafing just isn't all that great, and getting stuffed with a counter hit in such a rapidly paced game kinda sucks, but at least it's there. Throw breaks send characters pretty far, but you've still got that reversal option, and even though mix-ups are good, the competitive play I watched featured a lot of hopping over lows, ducking high attacks, and backswing, which I figured was the fast evade mechanic that appeared in this game going forward, whereby, if a player inputs a block just before an attack hits, they'll automatically evade the attack. It's not a parry, but it's a decent alternative. Lastly, the light and heavy guard system returns, so defense is good, but you'll notice that the actual gameplay, the flow of battle, is decidedly linear, blazing fast, and doesn't make too much use of the 3D space unless a wall's involved, so how much mileage you get out of the defensive systems will rely on game knowledge and reactions. With far less room for error than something like Soul Calibur 2, its blocking glitch, being able to air control far away, and stepping, just to name a few. The game had a solid base of players, apparently even in Japan, and there's still a load of competitive matches uploaded to YouTube. Unfortunately, it never really spoke to audiences like other games of its era, and at an establishing moment for next-gen fighters. So, you wish to develop your game for the Nintendo GameCube? Very well, but we require tribute. A price paid in blood. <laughs> Bloody Roar Primal Fury, or Bloody Roar Extreme for Xbox havers, is an updated kind of re-release. It's certainly not the same game, the stages are different, the gameplay changes really impact the experience. They added like two characters depending on which port you have. Alice is a different person? Oh, and there's no blood, just sparks. Damn, Nintendo just hates fun. What the series lost in hemoglobin, it gained in anime. I think this game tried to step up its presentation, like the last entry tended to leave journalists with the impression that Bloody Roar was cheap. Unfortunately, not having any kind of voice work in the story cutscenes doesn't help your case, no matter how many beautifully animated frames you paid for. And the Xbox took all that out because America hate anime. I'm more interested in the competitive discussion of this game. See, Primal Fury was supposed to be an update, and holy Jesus, they mucked it up in some really damaging places. They used the skeleton of three, mind you, and that's a strong foundation, but this game's a great case study on how small tweaks can completely warp a game, even if you're improving on the whole. And I understand that there's a pretty decent following for this installment, and that most of the issues can be ironed over with experience, but it's stuff like buffing Strafe. Strafe isn't good enough, once said a bumbling fool, not knowing with what powers they trifled. Strafe is a universal get-out-of-jail-free card. It's dumb. Getting put in the corner, walk out. Enemy trying to grab, walk out. Mix-ups, block strings, whatever's on tap, walk the f out. It doesn't help that strafing can also negate the recovery time of your own strings. It's an all-purpose tool on a button. It's completely insane. Now you can say, well, K-Bash, I think I'll use horizontals to combat it, and yeah, that's possible, but this isn't Soul Calibur, where you'll catch an enemy sidestepping with a move and follow up with a brutal punish. And it's so easy to weave into your play, nothing like that clunky walking or reactable stepping. Now, air cancel still exists, but air control is buffed, which mostly 
defeats its purpose and lets players recover out of damaging air combos much easier. That wouldn't be a problem, I'd be fine with that, only the character balancing is thrown into question here. Like I said, every character in 3 had something they could abuse, and if you scrub through competitive footage, you'll find that some characters excel on the ground and others in the air. Suddenly, certain characters that had an abusable tactic immediately take the bat. Others really suffer from strafe abuse because of their particular block strings. Some players purport that the overall balance is stronger among characters in this installment, but there isn't enough data to truly confirm that. Maybe some cheesy stuff is gone, but I think I'd take cheese over the dominance of hitting the walk button. Nothing's more cringe than setting up a strong offense and having player 2 slip away for free. The last major change is Hyper Beast, which was admittedly very powerful in 3. Any cancel point for safe offense, quick health regen, speed, but you'd lose the ability to transform thereafter. It was a powerful last ditch effort, though you needed a full bar to use it. In Primal Fury, you can activate at any time, but you'll lose proportional health if your beast gauge isn't maxed, and you won't get locked out of transforming later in the match. The actual mode is toned down, aligning with Primal Fury's generally weaker combos, but every character gains a passive bonus. Chip damage on the mole, for example. The trouble is, some characters are extremely blessed by the bonuses granted by Hyper Beast, and others get invisibility. I pretend I do not see it. It's cool to try and flavor your characters, but the best competitive things are fairly consistent universally. I think it's enough that characters have varied attacks and attributes before Hyper Beast factors in. And regardless of increased balance, there's still some pretty clear tier delineations in the upper echelons. Alright, wall surfing your enemies, pretty chad play. But you know how this story goes. No widespread community, poor sales, questionable changes, and rocky mechanics. But, but, the trick is there's four different versions of this game. One called Primal Fury and three called Extreme. The two Japanese Extreme versions fixed sidestepping and it's what you'll see current players playing online. The issue here being denying Americans access to the good copies of their game. It never realistically had a chance. At this point, the series is a car at the end of a cliff. You know, one push will do it. No stop, what are you doing? Just when this series tries to fly, Konami's here with the anti-air. Konami didn't make the dumb choices, K-Bash. Yeah, that pachinko rumor might be squashed, but that ain't hope, friend. All right, serious part of the video's over, everyone. You can all go home. Failure after failure, Bloody Roar couldn't land a hit. What can I say? The market kept strafing. Bloody Roar 2 was the most successful at under half a million copies in 1999. Things were looking grim, but Nintendo's damnable blood pact was broken, and Bloody Roar landed on the PS2 one last time in all its crimson M-rated glory until people played the game. The series always used as much as it could from previous games, and every old model from Extreme got ported over. New models and new costumes are cool. If you're not modeling a lot of stuff, this being a fighting game, at least model a change of clothes. Even then, none of the new characters in Extreme made the leap. It's absurd. Of course there's new characters. Dragon Guy with Little Girl. He's kind of a puppet character. Interesting addition. Dude, you can kill the child! You got Reiji. Sweet. Love my edge bros. And you got Nagi. I'll buck the trend. Usually this character gets dunked, but whatever. I personally wish they cut all the non-animal characters out in the first place, even if Shion is literal human perfection. But if they're opening the gates, I think she's fine. She gets a sword arm. It's fun. And there's a sick joy I get in watching her annihilate the cast, okay? This isn't a murder. It's a slaying. And all told, the game has more to do than any of the previous games. It's just that it locks important series characters behind arbitrary point collection and arcade mode, artificially padding the game time, but that's fine. Lots of games do that and nobody cares. Wouldn't want to start playing favorites. And frankly, I care about the gameplay, not the arcade mode, not the terrible cutscenes, nor the unnecessary mission mode. Not to sound like myself, but what is this? What is this? Bloody Roar 4 pushed the series in a new direction. Suck. The health system is redesigned, the health bar functions as before, and acts as a buffer or sort of padding to the beast bar. Basically, if you lose all your regular health, you'll be transformed until your beast gauge is empty and you die. That's assuming you never transform. But the beast gauge acts as a beast form health bar, like before, and gets used to perform beast drives, which will chunk down a portion of the bar. In summation, you have two health bars if you never use beast drives, but you can expend some of your potential health for damage. It's extremely unintuitive, and I had no idea what was going on until I 
I looked it up. You don't want your rectangles to be unintuitive. Worse still, it just makes matches go longer. Your typical beast drive, your power move, is only gonna do about 40 to 45% of the enemy's total health, which sounds like it'd be good, but your human form attacks restore beast drive, the second health bar the game forces you into when you're out of regular health. Matches that should take as much time as before go about twice as long because every human mode attack has effective vampirism when you've used some of your beast gauge. You can even sacrifice your health and charge up your beast gauge uninterrupted. So there's an attempt at strategic meter management, but I can't imagine why you'd sacrifice your only resource that lets you build your other for free with confident play. And it doesn't matter if there's some arcane galaxy brain logic behind this change because nobody wanted it. The game has no competitive scene. You know, don't play with fan expectations. If your system is needlessly complicated, well, speaks for itself. Hyper Beast is in the game, but there's so little info available on it, and since I never saw it come up, I'll leave it at Hyper Beast not as good as previous games. Just do what 3 or Extreme did. What really pisses me off personally is the great unbalancing. Even if the past two had their issues, this game has extremely strong characters and very weak ones. One of the contributing factors and overall one of the dumbest inclusions I've seen in games is giving some characters, not all, some, the ability to hold the guard button in beast form and automatically evade every incoming attack. Look, you weren't there, but when I discovered this, I was blasting vomit. My controller is ruined, my birthday's in April. You can write down a litany of issues, carve them on slabs, start a religion, doesn't matter. Bloody Roar is that once-in-a-lifetime flame, that passing fancy nobody seems to see. It had potential, and that potential was squandered. Barring any miracle revivals, Konami doing the right thing, I'd say it's time for a farewell. Stay gold, Bloody Roar. Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good, thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons, who are... Errol. Azero. BZ Soul. Beverage Crisp. Boha. Brandon. Caesar T. Chief. Cody Golden. Corgi the Lad. Couch Moba. Crack Stuntman. CW Glassworks, Kyle Lapreed, Damaged YouTube Analytics, David Castillo, Den Het, Don't Worry About It, Dylan Coffey, Editorial Entertainment, Exa, Frankenstitch, Harkage, Huey, Jason Lasky, Jaden, J. Deus, John Weber, Joke Frog, Justin Sherry, Kelvin, Craden, Latrix, Laundry Mom, Lego Sid, Lucas Phoenix, Markulies, Marmato, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Milky Moo Official, Mr. Dodongo, Miles Burris, Old Burgle, Only LK, Orn Magnus Palson, Pink Peacock, Quillworth, Reggie Rodriguez, Ricochet Frame, Salty Smasher, Sam Anga, Sekai Noah Warida, Seamus Nerd, Shod, Simp God, Special Children, Spooky Grimalkin, Super Sandwich Guy, Tenken Zephyrborn, Thrips Heartrop, Travis Edwards, Venom, Viewers Like You, Vic, Walter Taggart, Well Shit. Zachary V. Zanasso. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. If you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.